anxious and disconnected students back in the school building. So we have some staff who will be attending. Um, as attending school on time and on a consistent basis is crucial for student success. So we're excited about that and that's happening next week. Um, also, Duxbury Public Schools is sending a group of staff to the MassQ conference. MassQ stands for Massachusetts Computer Using Educators. The MassQ conference is a two-day event featuring workshops, demonstrations, and presentations by thought leaders and educators on how to enhance teaching and learning with technology. And Duxbury will have a group presenting at MassQ. The Instructional Technology Director, Cheryl Lewis, Curriculum Supervisors, Rita Marie Benoit, and Sarah Milner, and myself will be presenting a workshop on the use of data and how we use data in our implementation of analytic view and how we use that to make decisions regarding instruction, intervention, as well as progress, student progress. Um, this year, we also, I want to note, in regards to curriculum reviews, we have three areas that we will be undergoing curriculum reviews. Instructional technology will be taking place, and that review will be led by Instructional Technology Director Cheryl Lewis. We have the guidance curriculum review, which will be led by Lisa Dembowski, and we have our music curriculum review, which will be led by Jill Norenberg. And so as part of the review process, we'll be conducting the SWOT analysis again with strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, as well as conducting an internal review of our resources. And that's all I have for this evening. Right. Happy Thanks, to Dr. answer Wilcox. any questions. Are Welcome. teachers from every school attending? Do we have representation from all four schools for the uh, anxious kids, anxious students one, or parents one? Yes. Oh, awesome. Anything else? So I like how halfway through your update, all of a sudden your voice amplified. It was like Lou Gehrig, right, all of a sudden. Awesome, thank you. Uh, all right, next is uh, Director of Business and Finance, Mrs. Freely. Hello. Okay. It works. <laughs> um, since our last meeting, we have processed one accounts payable warrant, warrant number 12, totaling $577,059.68. Um, and I have an update, a very brief update, on the warrant sign-off process. Um, we have not been able to replicate um, our process. We actually discovered there's a glitch in our TalentEd system, which is where we send the warrants from. And so we need to recreate our steps in within the application, um, which we will do with the next warrant next week. So everyone should get a notification email um, next week. And if you do not, by the end of next week, please let me know. I've asked myself to, I've asked for myself to be added to the distribution list so that I can also see the same that you all see. Um, and then we can troubleshoot and see what, what issues, if any, there are. Um, for the warrant that we did process, we did have um, a wet signature done on that. Um, but if you would like to see um, the warrant, we can get you uh, a scanned copy of it. So we're not behind on we're not behind. Anything. We're okay. up to date on all the on all the signatures, um, and we will fix it for the next one. Excellent. Great. Lisa, can you just? Uh, I have two questions. If a parent submits reimbursement for something, what's the turnaround time? Like six, eight so, weeks. So it should typically take a, about four weeks, but a lot of it becomes the timing of when we get the documentation and ensuring the documentation has all the right backup that, associated to it. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that we process warrants um, every other week on um, checks are cut on the week opposite of payroll. Um, so there's that. And that just is a two-week turnaround time from when we are entering invoices or reimbursements to checks being turned around. But typically it's because we do things in advance. It's a month, I'd say. Um, but really it's timing of when we get that documentation. So it could be a little bit longer than that. Um, so it would not be unusual if it did end up being six weeks just because of the time frame of the payables warrant process. Okay, thanks. And then my other question was last meeting, this has been rattling around my brain, um, you had mentioned that with the joint FinCom meeting, the town said that we wouldn't get level service, but they were looking at 4%. Yes. So 4% is level service. We got like 4.2 last year, 4.1. So... There, what, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I mean, we don't have to get into it, but just something right. to think so about I, for the presentation. So in some of the conversations that I had had with the town, their target is usually somewhere around two, two and a half percent. Yeah. Um, and that's where they're looking at level service from. And so they, their communication was generally, we're, because of inflation, we wouldn't be looking at that as a level service number. We would be looking at something closer to 4% okay. as a number, but they didn't give a firm number. Got it. So they're saying 4% because the money won't go as far because of inflation. Okay. Yeah. And they still think that won't be level service. They believe that's above level service. Above it. That's contradictory. <laughs> okay. Right. And, and the way that they worded it, it was not an exact, like, it's going to be 4%. It was, like, around 4%. Yeah. Okay. All right. <coughs> Thank you. You're Any other questions? All right. Uh, next update is uh, Director of Special Education. That's Mrs. Tucker. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, just a brief update on ESY service delivery. We've had nine students who started service. That's great. Thank you. That's not awkward. Don't you love no, using the microphone mid-update? <laughs> um, so anyway, it's nine students who have started receiving service. We have another six that are um, on deck between either tomorrow, the rest of the week, and being added following and we have four students that are in the process of being scheduled. Um, my next um, exciting sort of um, parts and pieces or something I'm looking just for a little reminder help on is indicator 14 is about students who separated from the district during the 2021 school year and I sent out another email blast saying what are you doing now please um, use the survey link that's been sent to you another email uh, another respondent popped in but if anybody's out there and listening and you can either forward that link to your child or explore the link help us to find out what your child's doing now we greatly appreciate it um, I have um, my second open office hours with um, Caitlin Sheehan director of DEI is joining me we have a session for Friday at 8 30 a.m. we tried to do an after school and um, morning session to try and catch as many um, parents as possible um, exciting is um, the CPAC is um, doing their basic rights and they are having the Federation come on October 12th at 6 p.m. and the CPAC business meeting is going to be October 17th at 6 p.m. Um, both in Alden 102 and I've learned to use the owls so we can try and do both um, and then my last piece is the unified basketball team is really trying to gain some support so if you are around for home games or you're able to help volunteer support in any way shape or form there are uh, 4 p.m. on Wednesday October 12th uh, 4 p.m. on Friday uh, October 21st uh, and Friday October 28th um, and then anybody who's interested in Soulful Girls, that's happening to Friday night at 6.30 at St. John's. So Great. that's uh, what I have. Thank you very much. Any questions? Other school districts have unified basketball teams as well. So I know Pembroke has one. I believe Hanover has one. And so they travel. They ha we have a couple travel games, and we have a couple games here. But I think it would be great if we could fill the stands um, for our students. And it is listed on the Duckberry Athletic website, high school website. You can find their schedule just like you'd find any other sport. Oh, good. Cool. Why don't we uh, move to uh, student representatives update, Jake and Mike. Sorry, I didn't turn it off. Okay. Are you nice and close, Jake? I, yeah. Because if I you're not close enough, enough, someone's going to get up and move it. <laughs> All right. Um, so to start, I just want to talk about the co-curricular fair that was held Thursday the 15th, and there was over 40 different clubs represented, and there was a huge turnout. And I know a lot of kids signed up for clubs that they hadn't previously heard about or were interested in joining. I know student council got almost 230 kids to sign up and we had our first meeting on Monday and there was, I think, almost 200 kids there. So really good turnout there. And then another thing that I want to mention is the volunteer week of service that the high school will be um, 
holding, and that is a coordinated effort between the National Honor Society, sports teams, and student council, where kids throughout Duxbury will go volunteer throughout Duxbury. It could be at the thrift store, through the Interfaith Council, the town litter sweep. Um, there's a beach cleanup. We're helping a elderly couple in town whose 90th birthday was just a few weeks ago, moving wood for them. There's a bunch of different volunteer activities for kids to sign up for that email should be going out today. And that will be the week of September 27th through October 1st. And that's all I have. That's great. Um, additionally, the uh, superintendent's advisory cabinet met uh, last week. One thing we discussed was the inclusion of a school-wide therapy dog, which we did have prior to the lockdown. And conveni conveniently enough, um, a middle school teacher that was hired this summer ha um, has a therapy dog, which we hope to schedule around the school in the coming weeks. Uh, additionally, we discuss support for seniors applying to college and scheduling concerns. Uh, and finally, we're hoping to make a bigger push for school spirit this year as we go into a new year, fi finally, that's normal. Um, and finally, at Alden, students finished their instrument selection this week, and 198 out of 206 students chose to play an instrument, which is a record number. Wow. Wow. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I talked what fast. You, you were pushing? Uh, there was a big spirit. push for school spirit. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, did you want to do an update now, Dr. Klingman, or did you want to defer to later? I will defer. Thank you. you I'm defer. sorry I'm late. I was in a meeting <clears throat> in Boston, and I got here as quickly as I could. But you got here safely. I That's did. What's important. I wasn't All speeding. Right. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, just a few updates um, that I had on my list. We have. Uh, September office hours uh, next Wednesday, right? Wednesday at, l at 10, it's in the morning, 10 a.m. And we've already had one sign up, so we've got two opens, in case you wanted to slide in. Okay. Um, and I also posted, and I think I sent everyone an email with a link on our shared drive, just a tracker of yes. the comments and stuff, or the, at least the issues that have come up, um, so we can keep track of, of those conversations as they happen. And um, I've been really pleased with them so far, so that's great. Uh, just that uh, Dr. Klingerman might have been planning to, to, to talk about this, but I just wanted to give an update on the um, Chief Technology Officer interview process. So uh, Dr. Klingerman and I were among the um, interviewers uh, this week of our four uh, finalists, uh, or semi-finalists, I guess. I think the plan is to uh, have Dr. Klingeman and Rainey Reed, who the CTO is going to be reporting to. Uh, they will, with our feedback, uh, whittle down that list to two finalists. And I think the plan, in, in case I'm mistaken, is for you and Rainey to do your own interviews and maybe tours and stuff with the two finalists. Is that right? I think there was, um, after you left, I think it was determined that there was going to be one finalist recommended. Oh, and okay. so I believe that that process um, is continuing, but I'm not sure when the final interview will be. But it will be with Rainy Reed and me. Good. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to that. Big shoes to fill, and I know it's a real need to fill. Yes, so. we're anxious to fill both of those sure. uh, technology positions and that we have that, open. And will the CTO be helping with applications like you described for warrants and stuff, or is that the vendor that deals with that? Um, not for that particular No. Okay, so there's all right, not application specific. Okay, great. Um, I know uh, because my son is in middle school, we have an open house tomorrow for middle school. Are all the open houses this week for all nope, the schools? No, high school or? already had it. High school already high had school it. High school in Chandler, and then a middle school is this week, and next week is Alden. Good. The uh, ones that have happened went reasonably well? Yes. Yep. Good. Everything went well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so I just wanted to... Uh, remind everybody that um, uh, the vice chair, Kristen, and I meet with Dr. Klingeman once a week for a standing meeting on Monday. And mostly the purpose of those meetings is to help craft the agenda for the upcoming school committee meeting. But I just want to remind everybody that, you know, we welcome and have a thirst for your folks' ideas on what you'd like to see on the agenda. So um, there's a process for it. It's really easy, but high level view is just let me know. Uh, we'll bring it up to Dr. Klingeman in the meeting, and we'll make a decision on whether and when it can be covered, and, and uh, that, that's how it happens. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone is in the know that we all have a voice to inform the agendas of these meetings. Um, 
the goals of the school committee I mentioned at the last uh, meeting, but some of the specifics around um, you know goals and objectives were quarterly meetings for a couple of uh, things. So I wanted to mention that um, on our goal sheet, we had decided that we wanted to have uh, a quarterly update from the business and finance subcommittee. So I know Mrs. Deacon isn't here, so she makes up half of that committee. But um, given the fact that November is typically the budget presentation month, it might be interesting, you know, no pressure, but if you guys want to talk amongst yourselves and give some sort of an update next month, we have two meetings that might be helpful. Um, we also have uh, school council school improvement plans and reports on October 19th. I think on the agenda, typically, it's the school improvement plan. But uh, again, on, the, on one of our goals uh, as a school committee was to tighten the relationship uh, between the school committee and the school councils. And one of the action items was to uh, invite school councils to give like a quarterly update at school committee meetings. So we don't have to decide right now, but it might be interesting um, in the second October meeting when they're scheduled to give their school improvement plans, maybe to weave in sort of a, just a high level update on anything else that they'd like to update us on. From okay. school council. I have a question about that sure. because it was brought up at one time to do Chandler and Alden first at one meeting in the middle school and high school at a second. So oh, yeah, we did that last year. Right? So the principals are open to doing whatever suits the committee. If you'd rather have all four of them at the October 19 meeting, we can do that, or we can have um, Chandler and Alden do their draft plans at the October 3rd meeting. So Would they be ready for that? I believe so. Okay. Well, why don't we, why don't on our next standing meeting, why don't we talk about that? So. Okay. Okay, great. Um, uh, and then just a couple of other things. Um, in the last or second to last meeting of the last school year, I think it was the last meeting, um, the DEI coordinator gave an update, which I think was really welcomed and appreciated. And we sort of thought out loud in that meeting that it might be helpful to make those updates more frequent, again, on a, on a quarterly basis. So I know things are starting to sort of heat up, but, um, if uh, if Mrs. She if Ms. Sheehan, you know, is uh, interested in you know just giving a high level update on what's going on with the audit and the D and what she's doing with DEI, that might be helpful. And again, we can talk about it. But I just okay. wanted to raise it publicly. And I think that was it uh, for my updates. Any uh, did any other member have any updates, particularly with liaisons or anything related? I just had a few. Sure. You want to start again? Not really. So Could sponsorship, <laughs> is there a policy on sponsorship banners on our fields? There is. Yeah, we talked about this, I want to say two years ago. Yes, I wasn't here. Yes, there is. They would like to revisit that. They were wondering if we could put it on the agenda. I'm assuming it has to go to subcommittee first. Yep. Um, but they would like us to revisit that and potentially, this is way too close to me, potentially discuss it as a group. And maybe they come in and share their feelings on it. OK. All right. Well, we can do it at policy subcommittee. Should I right. have them reach out to you? Why don't you have them reach out concerns? to me so I know exactly what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. OK. That would be great. Thank you. And then I did want to give Mr. Gosselin a shout out from the from Alden. I pronounce this, I call him Mr. J. So, but that's, I pronounced it right. So during the summer, which um, he, may not have gotten a lot of recognition, but I do want to point out, before the school year ended, he worked with the student council to um, collect a bunch of items that the senior citizens might like, and they made a total of 60 goodie bags for our senior citizens. And um, a few of them were able to come along with me and Mr. G and deliver the goodie bags along with their home meal delivery. And the seniors were extremely excited um, great pictures. The remaining bags went to people in their day program as well as seniors that frequented the senior center. So I just wanted to say what a great job him and the student council did at Alden and the seniors loved it. And I know he's going to try and continue that um, through this year. 
Great. And then on a completely separate note, the Google slide, can we increase it to, to um, include any parent feedback, not just feedback received during office hours, just so we can have a central the place? Slide. The Google slide. You mean the, oh, you mean the, the spreadsheet? The yeah. Google doc. And you wanted it to, to be Well, so say if someone just like calls me and says, hey, Kristen, I have concerns about X, Y, and Z, I think it would be good to have a central location of parental concerns just so we can see patterns or, and it's also a good way of communicating amongst the four of us. Do you want to make a motion? Is that, I don't, I mean, it's an informal document, Make right? a motion and then we can discuss it. Wait, and then oh, okay. Does it, it has to be a motion? Yeah. What am I motioning? Making a motion to add all parent comments to the Google Doc that you created for the office hours feedback? Second. Okay. That was perfectly put. That was, that was really great. Right. You know, it takes me a little while Anyone to spit any, it out, but I get there. Any discussion? So does that just mean we, so if somebody calls me, I can go into the Google Drive and add something? I, yeah, I thought it was. I didn't realize that. No, I think so it's a formal. good idea. Well, I think it's a way to track public comment a little bit, too, just to, like, maybe make sure that we're tracking themes and, you know, if there seems to be something that's thematic and <laughs> brought up often that it gets on an agenda. So. I don't think it can hurt. I think it can only help to just change it. So um, I'll make sure I'll double check. I think everyone has editing access to it, and I'll just dress it up so that there's columns for to make it easy to be able to put the right thing in the right place, whether it's a public comment or whether it's a private email or whether it's some other vehicle like the uh, office hours. And that's, yeah, and that's only seen by us? Or is that, that would public? only be seen by us. Okay. Yeah. So, I think it's great. Any, is yeah. good? Sounds good to me. Okay. So the, the question is to expand the tracking spreadsheet to include all parent feedback, not just what is communicated in the office hours. All those in favor? Wait, I have one more question. Sure. Does that have any any open meeting law? We're so, not discussing it. We're just putting it on there. Yeah, the way so the way I have it in the tracker is I just write I have a column that says issue or question. And so if someone comes and says I have an issue with COVID vaccinations. I put under that column, I say issue, or I say concerns about COVID vaccinations. There's no editorial comment. It's just no opinion. Up. Sorry? No opinion. There's no opinion to it. There's no opinion. Um, I just write, state what the, um, what the concern was. Okay. I don't address what we talked about. I don't address what my opinion is on the concern. I just say this. Okay. And I find it to be helpful because even though we've only had three office hours, we're already seeing sort of many trends on what people are bringing up. Okay. Yeah, so just remind us, like, no, when you put it in, it's just, boom, bullet. Yep. Bullet points, you love bullets. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes for nothing. So we okay. do want to be formal because, um, first of all, we're supposed to be, and secondly, the more... Um, procedural we are, the less we're going to interrupt each other. So I'm um, just, I think it's probably just a good consistent rule to, you know, if you want to make a decision or if you want to discuss something, put a motion on the table, second it, and then we can discuss it. And then if we make a decision, we'll repeat the question and make the decision. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I have one other thing. Yeah, go ahead. I thought it was going to be under unfinished business, but the benchmarks. Danielle had asked us to, Dr. Klingman had asked us to go over the benchmarks for the action plan. I thought it was so, going to be under unfinished business. So there are two agendas in the packet. Oh, um, then I must have the, the old one. The second agenda is page three, which is a revised agenda, because we thought we had to post okay. two agendas based on that. Feedback. Sorry, I only have the old one. The okay. lashes with a wet noodle, Kristen. Do you have anything else you want to bring up? That way it was on the paper. We grabbed it from here. It's not on this one. So I have unfinished business B, vote on strategic plans, strategic initiatives, mission, vision, core values, and intended outcomes. It's hey, I'm fine with it. Three of the packet. Yeah. Okay. You saying there's a B? Okay. So <clears throat> there's a meeting packet 
um, that we put together that the central office does a really great job of putting together before every meeting, like two days before every meeting. All you have to do is go to the website and click on that packet and you'll get a whole PDF. And um, in the packet on the table of contents, it has a second agenda. It says revised agenda, uh, which is page, page three. So just for future reference. Okay. Good. Totally fine. No opinion. I don't bring my computer, so I no, pick I up either. the meeting. I pick this up here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I print off what I need. I have my agenda from here. I save paper, Matt. That's wonderful. <laughs> Packet can be opened Just on saying. a computer. I did. I looked at it. Okay. Great. And next. Any other questions on the packet? On the revised agenda? Okay. All right. So we do have two items on unfinished business. One is a gaggle. It's a slew. It's like a mob of policy revisions. There's 13 of them. So in this case, um, what I would like to do is call an audible and have a discussion first about any questions that anyone has on any of those policies based on your review. And um, depending on whether people have feedback or not, uh, we can then, and we do have to do 13 motions. That's why I printed these out so we can do them quickly. Um, the idea is to approve, um, if we want to, approve every motion. So the votes have to be done separately, but rather than have 13 separate discussions, I'd like to have one discussion. And then assuming that goes well, we'll do 13 votes. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, so does anyone have any questions from the first reading, which happened a couple weeks ago and now on any of these uh, policies? I just have one on sure. JIC-MASC. Um, and I'm sure Danielle can answer this quickly, but it says that f for a, sus except for emergency removal or an in-school suspension of less than 10 days, a principal must provide the student and the parent guardian oral and written notice. So if a student is in school suspended for less than 10 days, there no notice is sent home? I mean, that can't, that. This, anytime a student has in school or out of school suspension, they have to have a due process hearing notice and so. So this says except for emergency removal or an in school suspension of less than 10 days, a principal must provide the student and the parent guardian oral and written notice and provide the student an opportunity for a hearing and whatnot. But that implies that if the school, the in-school suspension is less than 10 days, none of that has to happen? I don't think that was the intent, intended outcome. This is one of our new ones, Dr. Wilcox, that we were adding. I'm trying to think back to the policies, whether JIC was an addition to <clears throat> that we had not previously had. Let me pull up the old one. So while you're pulling that up, I can tell you that we didn't, we never had policy JIC. So okay. these were updates from MASC. Okay. Um, so we took the MASC language and okay. uh, built the policies based on the MASC language. So uh, what we might do, my, my suggestion would be to defer uh, this one. There's actually two JICs. There's JIC and JICA, which is student dress code. But I think you're referring to JIC, which is student discipline. Okay. Um, would there be any objection to deferring discussion on JIC for a, another reading at the next meeting? So if there's no objection, we can have maybe a more through, uh, sort of thorough discussion about it. Um, after Dr. Klingeman and Dr. Wilcox have a chance to look it over. That would be great because I want to check if that um, language is somewhere else in another policy or if it's in our code of conduct because we don't want sure. the two to contradict each other. So yeah. we can look into that. Yep. And the MA, and if you remember from the last meeting, the MASC got a little uh, excited about, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we originally were updating all these A policies mm -hmm. and uh, they, I think their heart was in the right place, but they took a look at other. Mrs. Tucker was just saying that. Go ahead, Mrs. Tucker. You can share that. <laughs> Sorry. This is 
good. Okay. There's actually law around student discipline and what you can and cannot do. And I think this mask policy parallels what the legal obligations are. And what I think the foundation of it is um, you need to provide parents notification, but there's an emergency sort of clause of something that's been like so egregious, you're allowed to supposedly emergency or you're allowed to remove a student for up to two days, but then it then it triggers like a due process piece to it, but you can't just suspend a student like ongoing without notification. And so when they're talking about the notice of suspension of less than two days, you do, you do need to notify parents, but the next part for the emergency removal is if a student poses a danger to person, property, or material, that's when it triggers that two-day piece if that makes sense, but you still have to, you'll end up having to notify the parent, but there is a, that, the notice of suspension, what they mean is then that emergency removal part for that more egregious behavior is where, um, I, I think that's how it actually reads, um, related to, you have to notify a parent, but you, um, orally or in writing, but then the, the piece of, I think, the part that you had questions about actually triggers the following paragraph related to the emergency removal. That's what I think if I'm reading that in the same way. But I think her question was about in-school suspension. Yeah, it says, it, I get the emergency removal part. It just says, or an in-school suspension of less than 10 days. Which is in our practice to not notify yeah, parents. Yeah, I mean, we always that's what I figured. Parents. So I just figured if it's in a policy, though. Well, yeah. we have yeah. a policy yeah. subcommittee meeting anyway. We could take a look and make yeah. sure we have that worded the yeah, way that we want to, it to. to. We have time to update that agenda. So right. why don't we do that? Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. That's mm -hmm. great. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So we'll, we'll defer that and we'll add policy JIC to the agenda for the subcommittee meeting. Great. Good catch. Any other um, questions or feedback on any of the other now 12 policies? Mm -hmm. Mike. Um, is JICK available on the website? I'm looking for it right now and it does not show up anywhere. JICK? Yeah. Uh, no, it's not. So JICK, there, there is a number of, there's a small number of policies that we hadn't had, but the uh, MASC, governing body of the state, they have, they've updated and create, they update and create policies from time to time. So we just want to be in line with them when we think it's warranted. Good question. Any other questions? All right. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll um, why don't we just do the motions one at a time. So um, can I have a motion to approve the revisions to policy AC, non-discrimination, non -discrimination including harassment and retaliation, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes for nothing, Suzanne. Can I have a motion to approve the revisions to policy AC-R, non-discrimination policy, including harassment and retaliation? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Four nothing. May I have a motion to approve the revisions to policy ACAB, sexual harassment, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Four zero. May I have a motion to approve to revisions to policy ACAB-R, harassment policy regulation, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. May I have a motion to approve the revisions to policy BDE, subcommittees of the school committee, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Four nothing. May I have a motion to approve the revisions to policy GBA equal employment opportunity? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes, four nothing. Can I have a motion to approve the revisions to policy GCF professional staff hiring, please? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes, four zero. Can I have a motion to approve the revisions to policy JB, equal educational opportunities, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes, 4-0. Can I have a motion to approve the revisions to policy JFABD, homeless students, enrollment rights and services, please? So moved. 
Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 4 0. Can I have a motion to approve the revisions to policy JFBB 1 school choice? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 4 0. Can I have a motion to approve Michael Malley's favorite JICK <laughs> harassment of students, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 4 0. And finally, May I have a motion to approve the revisions to policy JICA student dress code, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Wow. And all before dinner. That was good. Woo. Motion passes. Great. Aye, aye. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next item on unfinished business uh, is the uh, to vote on the strategic plan, strategic initiatives, mission, vision, core values, and intended outcomes. So, uh, may I please have a motion to approve the 2022-2025 strategic plan as presented, please? So moved. Second. 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 Okay. Discussion. You want to do your presentation? The one or, that I did last time. I mean, if you or do, you have any? I shouldn't say presentation. Is there anything that you wanted to add? I or? can just remind everyone that um, at the last school committee meeting, which I'll pull up just to refresh my memory. I presented the um, proposed strategic plan, which is actually called Planning for Success. Um, and in that presentation, I shared that our new model included um, feedback from a number of stakeholder members that we met with from March to June last year, and the administrative team worked um, in between our planning meetings and then over the summer to create the actual action plans. And during that time, the um, the beginning of the sessions, we we really focused on um, look envisioning the future and what we want our Duxbury Public Schools to embody in the year 2026 because this will be a four-year plan. And so, what I presented last school committee meeting was the revised, slightly district mission, mission, vision, and core values statements. Um, we created strategic objectives and initiatives, and um, we also have created um, performance outcomes. And so the Four strategic initiatives that our action plans will be built off of are build connected and interactive school and community partnerships with a culture of care and trust in the service of education, integrate and practice <coughs> excuse me, inclusive and culturally, culturally responsive instruction for all students that reflect our core values. Number three, establish a pre-K through 12 aligned standards-based curriculum. And finally, <clears throat> number four, which will probably have the most school committee involvement, is implement an inclusive financial and communication system and process that ensures appropriate <clears throat> and sustainable funding for Duxbury Public Schools. Develop a financial planning process that includes stakeholders. And so that, those were the components of the plan that I believe were recommended by our consultant to um, have the school committee take a vote on so that we can move forward. And the next steps with the strategic plan will really be that we put the plan together in a manner that it was like our last strategic plan, where it's posted on the website and includes some information about our town and our school community. Um, Marilyn Quilty has been kind enough to take many pictures of our students in the first few weeks of school so that we can have some student photos in the plan. And we'll make sure that the plan just is looking looking nice. That way anyone can pull it up on the website and see what we're working on. Um, and those action plans are what we'll be using to develop, which are underway, our new school improvement plans. So that's the actual meat of the strategic plan that we'll be um, developing our individual goals and our school improvement plans off of. And so that's just a little Recap, recap of what we talked about last time. Thank you. Thank Dr. you. Benjamin. Questions or discussion? So with that discussion, you had mentioned that just to go over the benchmarks for the Duxbury Public School Action Plan 2022-2023. And I remember having some of the similar concerns last year. My biggest thing is that I feel like our benchmarks need to be more measurable versus check marks or checklists. And I feel like a lot of them aren't necessarily showing or are showing completion versus progress. And um, I would like to see the goals be more measurable. I know sometimes they may be broken down a little bit further um, at a school level, but I still think at a district level we should have some measurable goals that we're going for. And at the end of the year, I always look back, I would like to look back and see how have we improved 
you know, our district's overall students' ability for reading, writing, math, and different curriculums. So I just feel like we need, I personally, me, I just need more measurable goals that can show hardcore progress versus checklists. Because at the end of the year, I don't want to see, yes, we achieved all our benchmarks, whereas really we just checked off boxes. I want to see how we grew in that year. So that is why, that is my concern. I, I mean, I think the overall plan is fine. I just think when it comes down to our accountability, we have nothing to hold us accountable. If we didn't achieve a goal, why didn't we achieve a goal? Do we need more money in our budget? Do we need a new teacher? Do we, not a new teacher, but like a new area or more teachers in one area? And I just feel if we had a more data-based goal system, we'd be held more accountable. We can then go for, look at our budget, go to finance committee. I feel like we could do a lot more with that. So that's my concern. Would it be okay if I responded of to course. that briefly? Yeah. Um, I just want to say that every single thing we do in the district is data-based and accountable. And so I think what we discussed when we were talking the other day is just that the action plans, we will certainly take the feedback and make them as measurable. They, they are measurable, but we can certainly take your feedback into account that um, you're looking for some data and graphs and charts to show progress, but I just want you to know, and I want to just state as in response to that, that every decision we make that we're looking at our student data and we have a lot of accountability measures as a district due to our MCAS testing and our uh, compliance audits and all of the other systems that are looked at on a yearly basis. So we certainly are data-based and data-driven and we will work to present to you as much data as we can. But tonight what school committee is voting on are not the action plans. That's I'm fine part of that. it. Yep. Okay, thank you. I have no problem with the, ac the action plan. And I feel like even you brought up the analytic, what you're going to give your in-service on. Like, I don't remember seeing, t like I would love to hear more of that in our meetings to chart like overall progress. And maybe it's because I'm more scientifically driven and I need number a lot of numbers. And I think you guys have definitely tried and the, the presentations have incorporated that and I am appreciative of that. So we'll leave it at that. I'm fine, yes. Thank you. Anything, Katie, on your end? Kelly? Good. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, the question is to approve the 2022-2025 strategic plan as uh, presented. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes for nothing. Great. Um, and I just wanted to uh, add my own comment. This was a, a long and involved process that took a lot of people and a lot of time. Uh, so I really want to thank everybody, in particular leadership, for coordinating everything, bringing on a really wonderful um, consultant. I think that added some specificity and dimension to this um, plan that we didn't see in the, in the last plan. So thank you to everybody um, who was involved in, in putting it together. It was a lot of uh, time and a lot of effort, and I think the end result is really wonderful. So thank you. Um, okay. Uh, why don't we go on to new business. The next uh, order of business is the special education audit summary. And I think that's Mrs. Tucker. Um, good evening. So I can start with just telling you a little bit about um, the special education audit, why it was conducted, the purpose. Um, so during the 2021-22 school year, we did an independent special education audit just to kind of look at our overall special education program and services, uh, making sure that they're in line with the state and federal regulations and to look at our overall satisfaction with our programs and services. Um, so this review had two pieces. We did a total program look and we did a, a language-based program evaluation. Um, 
The tiered focus monitoring is that state audit that I know I've talked about at nauseum over the past few years, um, where the Department of Ed comes into the district. Um, we do a self-assessment. We provide them all sorts of uh, documents and our written processes. And one of the components they look for is our ongoing um, evaluations of our programs and services. So we hired um, a couple consultants to assist with the process. Um, Ellen Whittier Harrington is an educational consultant, retired pupil personnel, um, which is like a special education administrator with a few other responsibilities. And we worked with Dr. Nadine Ekstrom, an educational consultant, former superintendent, special education director, to really um, dig into our programs. Our process included um, actually starting with uh, some focus groups to find out what were areas of interest, concern that um, stakeholders wanted us to further explore. So there was a focus group with the principals. There was one with the superintendent, assistant superintendent, uh, CPAC chairperson, and the school committee liaison to the CPAC um, or special education. The second uh, component was from those focus groups. Uh, an anonymous survey was developed and administered to parents, general education teachers, special education teachers, administrators, related service providers, instructional assistants, and um, one component of the, that second component was to look at our um, recent IEP team meeting survey. So with our team meeting notes, we provide a survey and um, that um, uh, Ms. Whittinger Harrington took that information and incorporated that into the summary report. So our process now is to uh, disseminate the information with the school committee, um, giving you a broad overview to dig a lot further with our CPAC and our parents, which we're excited to partner over and to share with our educators. Um, so the focus group interviews uh, included some of the questions about or you know, um, some of those topics came out are about effective communication, a review of the special education team process, asking questions related to assessments, um, you know, assessing the curriculum, instruction, service delivery, um, getting an overview status of professional development and training with regard to special education. Uh, survey categories looked at communication between all stakeholders, between parents, parents and general education teachers, parents and special education teachers, et cetera, re uh, related service providers across all of the components. The team process, um, even Zoom, the amount of time for team meetings, those were included. The student support team, which is the process where we look for about students um, and what is a disability, what might not be a, a disability, what is leading to some of that special education process, our co-teaching teams, our universal design for learning, um, our curriculum and access, and the professional development. Um, so the overall findings of the IEP meeting summary, which was included in the report, um, so whenever you have a team meeting, no matter what type, we have a set of team meeting notes that the team chair takes and provides to parents. And there's a link to our Google form. It is not anonymous. We had uh, approximately, uh, well, we had exactly 109 uh, respondents. So an overall participation rate of 23.6. Wait, um, on the prior page, it said anonymous. The, the parent district evaluation survey, our IEP team meeting survey, which was one component to this overall audit. Okay. Two so when surveys. we two, two, two parts. So we, in, when we were assessing the special education department, we did an overall anonymous survey to all of the stakeholder groups. Mm -hmm. This not anonymous survey is about the IEP team meeting process for the parents who had just had an IEP meeting. And it had always been in place even before the audit. It, it, and it actually, it, it's been in place. It's um, kind of a common practice that it was in place Duxbury, with Duxbury before it came here. I utilized it in my last district. Because you want to be able to take that information and find out if a parent says, you know, that wasn't a great meeting, you can go back to the team and find out what happened, what went on. Or um, very frequently, I take 
the positive comments and I put them in a Monday morning memo to share out to staff because they really appreciate being acknowledged. I do it anonymously. I take the student name and identifiers out, but it's actually really great feedback that we get. But you've only got 23%. So from what I understand, from a statistical significance of a um, survey response rate, anything over 11% is considered um, statistically significant. So I think the team chairs ask every time for the parents to complete the survey. And so I think that's, an, that's a percentage that we always want to see increase. We'd like everyone to fill that out. But sometimes I think they get up from the meeting and forget to do it. And so um, we talk about ways to follow up to make sure everyone fills that out if they can. Okay. From the, did you, okay. <laughs> um, from the overall, um, all of the indicators, there's approximately um, 13 to 15 indicators in that IEP team meeting survey. The satisfaction response rates across those indicators were between 95 and 99 percent satisfaction. Um, majority of the parent comments expressed how pleased they were with the care of their students. Um, dissatisfied response rates across indicators were no more than six out of 109 parents. So there was one indicator where there were six parents that had expressed some dissatisfaction, um, but that was the largest amount where we had um, anything in the disagree or strongly disagree category. Um, it was somewhat noted when this overall summary, the our IEP team meeting summary, when um, I think there was some questions related to, well, I don't understand how come it took so much time or things like that. And part of that is the 30 and 45 school days that are not a, a Duxbury driven, but a state and federal statute sort of driven information. Um, Can I ask about that? So if, if this was not anonymous, are you able to follow up with those types of parents then and say like, the team chairs reach back out because we look at this ongoing and reach out to say, okay, what happened? What can we do? We sit down, um, depending upon what the feedback is, with the team to talk about, was it the presentation of data? Was it the information? What happened? So we, we do utilize that information because I, I think it's, imp it's important. Um, from the overall anonymous survey, um, we sent it out ele um, electronically and there were electronic and then also gave parents um, who are unable to uh, utilize the Google form um, a paper based. So the consultant was able to, you know, reach them out, mail them out, receive them back. Um, we did send um, to 462 families and in the way Aspen works, it went out to 735 email addresses. So. Um, the ratings overall showed that 83% of the parents surveyed indicated that they were satisfied with the team and considered their child's special needs when discussing and determining appropriate programming components. Um, in district, parent satisfaction rate with special education services was 78%. Um, just to give you in terms of the demographics, where we had a total response rate, Chandler had a response rate of 32% from parents. Alden had a 38% parent response rate. Middle school had a 20% parent response rate, and high school had a 10% parent response rate. Across our staffing, there was 13% of the total general education teachers who responded. There was 38% of the special education teachers who responded. 26% of the instructional assistants. 47% of the building administrators. Uh, just a quick question because sure. I was confused by the um, by the summary report. So, 462 families and 735 email addresses. Those email addresses, that 735, mm -hmm. does that include the staff, or were there more nope, than 735 that was just sent out? Okay, so, all right, so seven. So there were more than uh, there were more than 735 are. surveys sent out. Correct. The 735 was just parents and families. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yep. Good question. I just want to comment. It's not for you, but looking at those numbers, um, I guess I'm disappointed in the teachers for not responding. That's a low response rate, in my opinion. Or am I missing something? I personally would have liked to see it a lot higher, too. Yeah. Across the board, I would have liked to see it. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, you can only do so much. 
I feel, I know you said 11%, but I would have loved to have seen like more than 50%, yep. in my opinion, to get a better grasp. And especially with the, the 109 on the non-anonymous survey, I think people are concerned to bring up concerns in a non-anonymous way. So it's concerning that their rates overall were so low. But I'm glad to see that it was positive in what we did get. Yeah, I would say the same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm not disappointed in the way the surveys were sent out. Right. I'm disappointed in that people didn't respond to them. <laughs> and so to me, I mean, you can draw as many conclusions as you want, but I, it's hard not to draw conclusions when you, you, you know, reading that so many people didn't respond that I, I have to ask, like, why, especially the anonymous one. You know, well, so it's not it's that, you, you know. that people don't believe things are anonymous. I mean, I think that's a general about anonymous surveys. I just don't think you people believe they're anonymous. Like, I don't know why, but I think that's an because it's sent to general. your email. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just don't think I think that there is a bit, you know, we talked earlier about culture and I think there's a cultural belief of like not speaking up. I think that it's an issue. And I think that that's something that I've heard a lot is that, you know, um, you're viewed as complaining where it could have been good feedback. So I think also when you do research, you tend to find that it's sometimes when you, you have to dig into um, how many responses you got and who is most motivated to complete a survey in a very busy world. And so it's the first, um, it's we, when we did this, it was the end of a busy school year. It was over a couple of months that we were soliciting feedback, but you tend to get feedback from people who have feedback to give, whether it's really positive or whether they've had a negative experience. And that whole middle group of a bell curve, you tend to not hear from them. So if it's not something that someone has feedback to give you, you'll find when you're doing research that that's the group that tends to not respond. But we continue to try to find ways to get feedback. We, we, do, we do staff surveys all the time. We've done them through Survey, Survey Monkey as well as through Google Forms, just for that reason, if people aren't sure if we do a Google Form, if it really is anonymous. And all we can do is reassure people that um, our anonymous surveys are anonymous. Um, and we use different formats for them to try to make that even more visible that it's anonymous. Um, but sometimes we also feel that when we give out anonymous surveys, we do get some extremely nasty responses that are it's just not OK. It, some of the feedback we receive. So we try to do a balance of um, holding people accountable that if you have something to say and if there's a concern, please let us know. We're always willing to speak to you. But sometimes it's not helpful when we receive feedback that is not easy to read and we don't know where it's coming from and we can't do anything with it. That can be really disheartening and hard to manage. So we try to do a little bit of both, I think. And I think we were hoping through the fact of an anonymous survey that we would empower people to respond and you know we had talked about what would what would focus group look like how are we doing that and i think um hoping to capture a greater audience understanding that not everybody can attend a focus group and you know does it at times lend itself to one group over another and you know trying to hit as many people as possible you know, that was, I think, the intent. Um, yeah. Um, so, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say, I, I know this, this is just a sticking point with me. I, as a school committee member, if a staff is given a survey about students, my expectation would be that they would complete it, which is no reflection on any of you. But I feel really strongly about that because we're all in this for the students. Survey. It's disappointing to see that low turnout because it's almost, you know, it's another IA in the classroom and to not get majority of people participating in it for something that was supposed to truly like help us grow, whether it be to enhance the posit positives that we're already doing, work on the middle ground and figure out strategies for the bottom. Hopefully going forward, we have better turnout especially with the, you know, the other audit that we have coming out for the DEI, so. Um, um, can I just say one other thing yeah. before you go on? Um, 
you know, it might be interesting if she's willing and if it's possible without spending more money. I'd like to, to know from either Ellen, possibly CPAC, I don't know if there's anyone from CPAC here tonight, or um, from our liaisons for SPED. I'd just like to see what other sort of what, how we rank against other districts, that, because everyone has to do these types of surveys, right? But you'd have to have a comparable tool to a comparable tool. We developed our tool off our focus group, so I don't know that we'd have an apples to apples comparison. We may not, but it would be interesting to know if Whitman Hansen did uh, some sort of audit around their special ed program. So everybody does do some sort of um, program review, what pieces they do, whether they're holistic or part and parcel because they're digging into different areas. They're all, everybody's required to do that as part of their tiered focus monitoring. Some people do those types of things in-house and do more of a local review. Other people bring in consultants. So I, I don't know how to. All I would do, yeah. and you don't have to do this, yeah. all I would do is pick up the phone and call someone on CPAC at Whitman Hanson and say, hey, do only 13% of your, what, I'm just picking a number, like, you know, last time you did an audit, did you get like an overwhelming response from parents and staff or not? That's all. <laughs> I'm not looking for anything scientific. You don't have to do it. I'm just, I just wonder if we're an anomaly or if it's just the human condition that like people don't sort of respond to these things before we, yeah. Sure, of course. Hi, I'm Jen Whedon. I'm one of the co-chairs of CPAC. Um, I was just going to say, I think there's probably a couple things we could do and partner on. Um, one, on like getting, trying to benchmark in whatever way possible. I know there's different sort of methodological approaches and best practices there. I think also, um, you know, something that we've been talking about with, with the school committee liaisons is really um, getting um, feedback from parents kind of in a, a little bit more rigorous of a way, anonymizing it, and then using that to augment some of these methodological approaches. So I think, you know, there's ways to one, see how we compare to other towns in different ways, and we can figure out what that looks like, but then there's also ways that we can leverage parent um, input um, that, that the liaisons get, that, that we get, et cetera, um, and use that to inform as well. Does that yeah, seem helpful? Great. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Jen. Thanks for that. No Thanks for hijacking the microphone, too. <laughs> All right. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time, and I'm super curious about the findings. And I'm wondering, Heather, do you think that you can like focus more of your time just on sort of like what bubbled up from your perspective as sort of interesting data points, the good and the bad? So I think um, just a summary of findings um, and things to consider are um, providing parents with opportunities for clarification of the process and mandates placed on us by um, state and federal regulations, provide some clarification around the tier one, tier two interve interventions available prior to, um, you know, special education, um, you know, to effectively prevent the over-identification of students with learning disabilities, mm -hmm. um, you know, increased knowledge around pedagogy, specially designed instruction, um, range of supports, um, you know, increasing the professional development for um, the instructional assistants. Um, there was a finding of continue with the Zoom platform. People liked it, and that the amount of team meeting, the amount of time set aside for team meetings was just right. Like I thought that was a great um, piece for me. Um, just to acknowledge the language-based program evaluation that um, it, we were identified as having really highly qualified staff throughout the district dedicated to the students that they service. Um, there's a really good understanding and appreciation for the value and importance of literacy instruction to support our language-based students. Um, you know, parents really spoke highly about the positive aspects of the language-based programming to support their students with um, reading. Um, you know, continue to look at um, how to more clearly define, again, the pedagogy, the curriculum, the instruction, and making sure we're communicating clearly and ongoing with our stakeholders. Um, so that's sort of a high level. That's great. Um, 
there were, thank you for that. There were a couple things, and hopefully this will lead to some further discussion tonight, but there were a couple things that jumped out to me. So um, first of all, this is hard work. Just from reading the summary, I can tell just um, there's so many different little ecosystems that make up special ed that it's really difficult to gain consensus on anything. And so it was interesting, you mentioned like the good feedback on the Zoom vehicle, which was good, but I think it was the general ed teachers that were dissatisfied, so you can't make everybody happy. So one of the things I was really interested in uh, at, the end of <clears throat> at the end of the summary report were different recommendations. Um, and uh, I would encourage, um, if you're not, you know, if you're, if you're not at a place yet to prepare to talk about those recommendations or whether you agree with them, I would um, recommend that, that all of us take a close look at those recommendations. I think some of them are really good. Um, a couple things that <clears throat> jumped out on me besides just sort of like those general comments. Um, so I think the, the, I think the biggest opportunity, and this is, this is all of course subjective because it's a, you know, I'm reading the summary through my own lens, but I think one of the biggest opportunities for improvement is, um, from what I read in here, is communication between the administration and the staff. It just seemed like that was, um, that was, that was pretty lowly, low, low um, that, that was sort of, that, that was sort of disappointing um, in terms of, uh, in terms of the feedback. So I just put a little box and I said, we communication admin to and from staff or staff to and from administration. So it seems like the, it seems like the, the players involved in there don't feel like they're either being heard or they're communicating enough. I don't know what the answer is. I think some of them are in the recommendations. Um, the other thing that the other thing that sprang out to me was the, the author of the summary made a couple comments on um, some parents, not a lot, but some parents, I think the it was word misunderstanding of the IEP process. And that informed some of the feedback. So they gave feedback, but the feedback was sort of discolored by the fact that they didn't understand how rules and regulations associated with IEPs were supposed to work. And so to me, that underscores really the need for, I believe, um, some way of being able to clearly and succinctly communicate what these rules and regulations are outside of episodic presentations. Because I think, and I've said this before, I think sometimes we get sort of trapped by doing all this really good work in giving a presentation to the community at the PAC or s giving an update in a school committee meeting and then you know, it's on YouTube, and, you know, and so when someone asks the question, well, how does this work? I think the human reaction is rightfully, oh, geez, do we have to do another presentation on this? Because we've done a presentation like 8,000 times. I don't think you gotta do another presentation. I think that we need to figure out a way to re-communicate it and package the communication in a way that's static and central so that the communication itself can be, let's call it the bad guy. That way, if someone doesn't understand how the IEP is supposed to work, send them a link to a little video that we did, a little explainer video. Maybe it's a, you know, that, that leads to other little explainer videos. Um, so if we are thinking about, you know, executing on some of these recommendations or coming up with our own recommendations and those are gonna cost money and require investment, I would comment that I think our money and investment could be well spent on ways of better packaging communication so that if people feel like they're you know, being heard, they feel like they understand the material, and if they don't understand the material, there's ways to give them repetition without any human effort. Because <laughs> you know, time is money. So the more we have to give presentations, and the more we have to trundle off to the pack to give like an Orton Gillingham presentation for the 60th time, that's money. So if there's ways that we can think about creating some sort of repeatable messaging that, yeah, is gonna have to be updated from time to time, but probably not that much. I think that would probably be, be money well spent. I think that's a great suggestion, and I really look forward to partnering with the CPAC to actually break that down into the parts and components. And I know we've started to <laughs> overview talk about it, but I think we have some good opportunities to really dig in more, and I think that's, um, 
a really great way to partner. And I think they offered very concrete strategies and suggestions moving forward. And on here, when you were saying that, they said, like, put the state and federal regs, easily accessible space on the website. For me, the biggest thing that jumped out was that our IAs and our administrators and even some of the related service providers don't receive, feel like they've received enough training. So I look forward, look to, towards you and what type of professional development are we going to have this year to address the concerns that came out of this? Because they're pretty large um, percentages of people, 33 to 44 percent. That's, you know, it's a large percentage that doesn't feel well trained because if they're not, if they don't feel comfortable providing the service, it's going to show in what the kids are getting. So I look forward to seeing continuing ed to address the things that she found in here. That was my biggest thing that I saw that I was concerned about. Can you tell you? Any other comments? No, I just love this develop a special ed focus group that coordinates with the new strategic plan. I just wanted to highlight that point. I think that's imperative. Sure. And I would love, oh, sorry. I was just saying, the language-based um, program review is a book and a half. <laughs> so I think, I mean, maybe not here, you gave a quick review, but I definitely think as part of a CPAC meeting coming up, there should be a more in-depth presentation on what she found and what we can go from here on because this is definitely worth more than one slide. Well, the, there was like a 15-page lit review in there, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's good. So thank you. Katie? Um, no, I think just, you know, partnering on what Kelly just said, I think it's great to have a focus group. Um, if there's, like, purpose, I just think that if we're going to bring, you know, more groups together, there should be some sort of definitive reason and, like, I don't even know if it's goal setting or whatnot, but... Uh, I, I, you know, we have the CPAC and we have other organizations, so I hope that if we do something like that, it's, it's, it's purposeful. Um, I think there was, you know, something said about the Tier 1 and Tier 2 supports, and I do think that that is a, a really big gap in our knowledge base for, I would say, most of the community. I don't think that it's widely understood. I don't think that most parents know they exist, and I think that that's one thing that I don't know, you know, I've read through this, but I don't know if um, with regard to what Matt was saying about communication, I just, I think we rely a lot on people knowing specifically what to ask for, and that's not in the common, like, parents' wheelhouse. If you know your child has an issue, you you start asking, but I don't think you really know exactly what to ask for, so I think if, and I hate to say dumb it down, but I think if there was more access to information that was more attainable for the average person um, I think that would go a long way to better understanding like where I should start asking instead of just like I want my child because the minute you say I want an evaluation like it's a whole process where there's like six steps that could happen before and I know you all know that but I just think that it's not widely known yeah and that's easy enough like where to start yeah. On a website, start here, here are the steps. Good. Any other any comments from this side of the table? Okay. Great update. Important work. And um, I think we should uh, definitely keep this top of mind and continue to revisit it throughout the school year since there are recommendations and I'm sure you have your own ideas on you know the path forward. It would be great to see um, what you come up with and how we can help. So thank you very much. As part of this, we also yeah. had the 504 I did um, see that. survey thank as you. well. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, so I saw that. We had included um, the administrators had created a survey for regarding 504s at the beginning of the school year. Their survey inc included questions about communication, understanding the student support team, the use of data, team considering individual children's needs, satisfaction with supports, parent voice, transition between schools, and understanding the role of 504s in post-secondary planning. So currently we have 194 students in the district on 504 plans and 60 families responded to the survey, which is approximately 31%. The results, um, which are shown here, 
show parents who responded satisfied to extremely satisfied to those questions. And so really, when you look at the result as an overall in our takeaways, takeaways for communication is that clear communication is definitely something that we can always continue to improve upon. And we want to provide space for conversations regarding student needs. So we want to continue to work to ensure that all members are communicating and that data is being shared with the families so that they are aware of the accommodations as well as the teachers are communicating which accommodations um, the students are using in the classroom. We also, I wanted to share that as part of this, the assistant principals have begun to meet um, together as a group and that is pre-K through 12. So we have Sue McNeil at Chandler, Chris Gosselin, Mark Henry, Jenna Lee Coyne, um, as well as um, Jen and Tom Bresnahan at the high school. So um, I also wanted to share that we are meeting regularly and so we are going to, we have already begun to look at our 504 process at all of the schools just to align them and make sure that they are all um, in alignment and we're constantly looking at how we're communicating, what ways can we improve and um, how that is working. I also wanted to share that our curriculum supervisors met today and also going back to the district um, curriculum accommodation plan, the DCAP, we talked about how we are have the document, how we are aware of the accommodations, and how can we provide professional development so that we are working with those accommodations and really thinking through um, how they're best utilized with our students, with all of our students to meet needs. So that goes back to our differentiated instruction PD that we had last year and really connecting it all together. So those are some of the things that we're working on. Great, thank you. And thank you for doing the survey. I only <laughs> harassed you guys about it just so I appreciate it I, I wasn't surprised by the responses I yeah I thought it was a little abysmal so I'm glad you're working on the communication great anything else on 504 thank you I forgot about that Welcome. all right great um, okay so oh wow this is office hours in action because the next item is the educator evaluation process and is it not? That is correct. Okay, and this came up in one of our office hour meetings. I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. So see, this is like, this is how the this is how things get done. Receive. This is how the sausage is made, man. We're not in your <laughs> office hours. Huh? I said, we're not all in your office hours. These are our office hours. Oh, you, unfortunately, never volunteer. Office hours. Yeah, the, the school committee Oh, office I thought hours. you meant when you and yeah. Kristen meet with Tanya. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nope, that's different than office hours. And so I did this presentation last year and it's timely because this is the time of year when we are setting our goals and looking at the year ahead. And so every school, public school district in Massachusetts um, has been doing a revised evaluation framework um, and we're all on the same plate page when we're, when we're doing this. Our Duxbury rubric is slightly modified than the state rubric. So if you were to Google the Massachusetts Educator Evaluation System, you would see that the rubric that we use in Duxbury is the tiniest bit different. So we have ours posted on the website. Um, so there's six parts of the Education Evaluator Framework, um, which is the standards that we work under and the rubrics. Um, we have three categories of evidence. We all have performance ratings, educator plans, and a five-step evaluation cycle. I'm gonna kind of skip through um, this a little bit fast, but if we, if we look at this slide here, right now in September, um, all licensed educators across this Commonwealth are, are doing a self-assessment of um, where am I as an educator? What are my strengths? What does my student caseload look like this year? Do I have some English learners in my class or do I have a few students um, on 504s with unique needs that I haven't experienced before? If so, um, they might be choosing to do goals or looking for professional development to be able to enhance them, their skills based on the students in front of them. So as educators, we're, already self, we're always self-assessing our strengths and what areas we would like to, to grow ourselves. After we do the self-assessment, um, each 
educator sits with one of their evaluators, and so our principals, assistant principals, our directors, like Mrs. Tucker, um, have caseloads of teachers that they work with and evaluate during the year. We also have our team chairs that um, serve as evaluators and our curriculum supervisors. So all of those people that serve as evaluators are meeting individually with their um, teaching staff at this time to set goals, making sure that they're measurable and accountable and they're based on student growth. Um, those goals are approved by each evaluator and even everyone at this table meets with me to do um, their own goals and we talk about self-assessment and where would we like to um, see, where would they like to work on their own professional growth. So everyone that has a teaching license needs to go through this process. All of our goals are based on our, either our district, if we're a district administrator, our goals should be based on our action plans and our district strategic plan. And all of our individual school members would be um, setting goals that are based on the school improvement plans that, we'll, that we are also working on right now. Okay, so that's kind of what I just said. Um, they also, as ed all educators across the Commonwealth are required to seek feedback of the people that they serve. So um, if you're a classroom teacher, you should be seeking feedback from your students about um, how, did, how did I do? What, what was worked really well in this class this year? What didn't work well? And I hope that our students have experienced that at some point where their teachers are asking for feedback. Um, we also model that as administrators and it's a little bit scary to send out surveys to the whole parent community and the whole teaching staff about what am I doing well and where could I get feedback but I promise everyone that it's always anonymous and I let people send it to me on paper if they don't feel comfortable doing it electronically. Um, so all of us have to put, a, put ourselves out there, make ourselves vulnerable and ask for feedback. Um, that feedback we receive does not need to be, it's not required that it's shared with your evaluator. However, you are, it's intended for that to feed your professional practice goal. So if you received some feedback um, during that process of surveying the people that you serve um, that was critical or an area of growth, that's certainly something that you should be thinking about and our evaluators are asking our teaching staff your survey data last year. Did you receive any feedback that would have um, kind of fed your professional practice goal? And I think that um, we work to develop surveys examples with our teachers if they just want to use the sample surveys that we suggest. Okay, so this is just a little bit about SMART goals and professional practice goals. So everyone needs to um, create a student learning goal and a professional practice goal as an educator if you're a teaching staff member or a specialist. Um, and administrators also need to create a school improvement goal. And so during the year, we all collect evidence to show, to demonstrate goal attainment. So if we set a goal that our students are going to make, um, if we're going to have 10% increase in students that are achieving um, a fall benchmark test or a winter benchmark test, um, we're collecting data along the way that we can demonstrate goal attainment. And part of meeting with your evaluator, you need to have shared evidence that you've attained your goal. Or if, even if you've, um, you can either show that you've met your goal or that you've even met and raised the stakes on what your goal was. Um, there are multiple, I think, we'll go to the next slide, Dr. Wilcox. So this is just what we started with. So the district strategic plan feeds our school improvement plans, which feeds our administrator goals, and then our teacher and our specialized instructional support personnel goals. So we have different kinds of plans that our educators are on. So if you're a professional status teacher, you many, most of our teachers are on self-directed growth plans. And so those plans are two-year plans if you're on professional status. So that means that you would have a formative evaluation at the end of year one and a summative evaluation at the end of year two. We also have directed growth plans. So if anyone receives needs improvement ratings on their evaluation, they would go on to a directed growth plan um, that can be up to one year in length. During that time, there will likely be more frequent meetings with your evaluator to show progress on the goals that you're working on. So when educators are on directed growth plans, that comes with really targeted goals that you would sit with your um, administrator and evaluators to, de um, to develop and to be able to demonstrate how you are working towards that goal attainment. Um, when we have educators that have received ratings of needs improvement that haven't improved or if they've been rated unsatisfactory, they'd be placed on an improvement plan, which are a little bit shorter in duration, so those can be 30 days up to one year, but typically those have shorter um, 
start and finish times. And a developing educator plan would be any teacher that is new to Duxbury that is in year one, two, or three. Even if they've been teaching for 10 years in another district, you always start back over again when you enter a new school district as a developing educator plan. And what that means is that's a one-year plan. So your whole process is abbreviated that you have your, um, you do your self-assessment, your goal setting, you have a uh, more frequent observations, both announced and unannounced. You have your formative evaluation meeting in January, and then you have a summative evaluation at, at the end of the school year in May and June. So everything is consolidated into one year, whereas the self-directed growth plan, you do um, your, ob your observations and your formative and summative are spread over two years. As part of our plan, um, administrators go into teachers' classrooms for observations, um, both announced and unannounced. And so those are held throughout the year, and there's pre and post observation conferences that are held with the educators. And so this is a time where if you are working with one of your teachers and you know what their goals are, you might say, okay, your goal this year was to make sure you were doing more centers-based instruction where you got around to do small group instruction in your classroom. Why don't we try to have that be your, um, what you demonstrate during your announced observation? So there's, there's conversations happening if teachers are working on writing in the content areas or if they have a specific goal that they're working on, often that will be what they will um, demonstrate for their um, announced observation. We also do an unannounced observations all the time. Sometimes they're written up and sometimes we just walk through our classes and visit, which is very common and our teachers expect it and welcome us all into their classrooms to visit. So um, those are the best kind when you can just stop in and it's not something that you write up to be able to see what's going on with the teaching and learning. Okay, I think I already mentioned that. So all new administrators to the district must be trained to be able to do observations and evaluation. If they're a new administrator, we do um, a thorough training that we usually have contractors come in to work with um, our new staff so that they can not only learn the fundamentals of doing observation and evaluation, but they can also go out and write a few and then bring them back for feedback um, and not so that we can take off the staff names and have the consultants and the people that we're working with give feedback on that process. We also always do a calibration training with our administrative team so that we're all trying to look for the same things, um, consider the same focus areas important so that we're not all going in with a different lens to say, oh, I'd really like to see you do this and then have another administrator asking for something else. So we always try to um, come together with some consensus about what our focus areas are year by year. Last year, we talked a lot about differentiated instruction and really being able to see when we go into classes, how are teachers adjusting their instruction for the students in front of them? How do you know students are learning? What check-ins are you doing before students leave each day to be able to drive your next day lesson plans? We, sh we don't want to just be teaching on our plan book schedule. We, we want to make sure we're teaching and that students are learning what we're teaching before we move on. This year, we are all focusing as a district as part of our strategic plan action planning on target indicator 2A3, which is meeting diverse needs. So that's part of that teacher, teacher rubric that we have, that we all work on. And meeting diverse needs indicator is the wording is below. The teacher uses appropriate inclusive practices such as tiered supports and scaffolded instruction to accommodate differences in student, students' learning needs, abilities, interests, and levels of readiness, including those of academically advanced students, students with disabilities, and English learners. So when we go through and do group walkthroughs or we do goal setting meetings or we do observations, whether they're announced or unannounced, we're really looking to see how we're doing in meeting diverse needs. Um, and I always look at that through that lens. I went into some classes this week and I saw a foundations lesson and I saw some kids that were definitely still learning the content of the letter sounds and the blends and I saw some students that had already mastered it, written the whole word out perfectly and they were kind of waiting. And so th that conversation with the teachers would be, okay, I see that you have some students that are still learning letter sounds and you have some that already are at the word level and sentence level. How are you differentiating to make sure that all the students are getting what they need? So we talk about that. Um, target indicator as being our focus area for, for this school year. Um, so each the, um, 
rubric has four standards. The four standards are curriculum planning and assessment, teaching all students, family and community, community engagement, and professional culture. So all staff members have the same standards that they're working under, and they're working to um, achieve proficient or exemplary on that. If we have anyone that's showing needs improvement in the standards, that's when we're working with them on either um, improvement plans or directed growth plans. That's our overview of just dates and timelines, so that's consistent with all of the schools, and we must meet the contractual guidelines for our observations, evaluations, and our summative um, informative evals that are written up. And I think there's one more, is there one more slide? No, yep, other important details, did I already do that one? Yep. Okay, that was it. So I just go over that just so everyone knows that all educators set goals, we're held accountable to goals, the goals are data driven and measurable. Um, we do have educators at times that are on directed plans and so if concerns come up it's not something that just is ignored, it's something that we work for, to develop with our educators to allow them to have some growth. If we work with our educators and there's not growth then we follow the process for next steps with that which is always a last resort to have teachers that don't remain with us are we always try to come from a growth a growth perspective first Go ahead. Well, I, have, um, um, I know you said like you seek like teachers ask their students how they're doing obviously at the elementary level that's I don't know that you can really do that so much um, but I also recognize you can't really send surveys to every parent we've seen how that goes um, but I have a question about it, it, do you look at trends, like particularly at like the high school level, if if there's particular teachers where you see like a lot of students dropping their class on a regular basis, or or things like that, or I know at the more at the elementary level, um, and and this is more subjective, so I don't know how you'd really look at it, but there's that opportunity to say like I would prefer my ch second child not have this teacher that my first child had, and again that's likely subjective, but do you do you look to see if there's trends there? Because there's not opportunity to give other feedback that's not just, do you know what I'm saying? Yes. So we certainly look for trends. Um, we get a lot of feedback from parents, and I think that we try to always give the parents the opportunity to talk to the teacher about it because that sometimes is the most uncomfortable step if there's concerns and your child is in a class to be able to say I, this isn't working for me or I have some questions about it so we do try to go through the proper chain of command. Um, I think our curriculum supervisors look closely at course enrollment, add drops and if there's any trends in that at the middle school and high school level um, for sure and I think that um, while we can't always ask for feedback of our youngest students I think that our Chandler teachers find ways to get feedback on their performance and where they have areas of growth and I think through conversations with families I would hope that all of our educators are open to anything that they're hearing from families about what works what worked really well this year for you for communication or, or that sort of thing so we certainly encourage anyone to ask for feedback we don't ask them to show us what the results were so we try to just let them know that we know it makes you vulnerable but please know that that's for your own growth only and that you can take that data for what it is um, but definitely we look for, we try to have conversations directly with staff if we start to see that there's parent concerns that are coming up that are starting to be a trend we definitely have difficult conversations whenever we need to, whether that's with um, the Duxbury Teachers Association and supervisors, and we have conversations where this issue has come up. Let's have a plan. We'll, maybe the teacher will go back to the parent if they haven't had an opportunity to discuss this, or maybe if it's a trend that's multiple parents have expressed concerns. Um, we, make, we make different plans with the support of the um, evaluators to be able to address those. So that's part of our practice, and we have to be pretty anonymous about about that, but um, it's certainly, we have procedures and practices in place when things come up that are areas of concern that multiple people have reported um, so that we can address that head on. I was curious, do you try and switch up the evaluators or is it the same evaluator for teacher multiple years or do you? Yes, that's I question. think Mrs. Tucker tries to do the first year special educators. Um, I think we do try to have the principal curriculum supervisors and assistant principals rotate. Um, the way they do it a lot of times would be a principal would be the second evaluator um, at the middle and high school level if it's a new staff member and the curriculum supervisor would be their primary evaluator. So at times it does happen that 
teachers may have the same evaluator for many years and if they request a change if it makes sense we can sometimes accommodate that and sometimes we can't always accommodate a change but usually you have a primary and a secondary so that anyone in your school would be able to walk through and give you feedback if they came in and saw something great and maybe if it's a curriculum supervisor at the elementary level that did the walkthrough but the principal's the primary evaluator anyone can offer feedback okay and then um I like your, the, it's not, sorry. I like the goal, not, not the goal, but the, the 2A, I don't know what you said it was. It was the, 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 I mean, the yes, nurse the needs focus a focus indicator. Needs, yes. My concern, I feel like I'm echoing now. I guess my concern is when you're in there and you're realizing that there is a lot of diverse needs in the classroom, is there a way to help get support in the classroom? You know, so say you walk into class and, you know, I'm sure there's times when classes are made up and you don't realize the diverse needs that are in there. Is there ways through that evaluation that you're able to kind of provide yes. support for teachers? Do you use those evaluations, I guess, is the question. Do it as using the, um, you mean the That's observations if, if it's noted that there's a yes. unique group? I would say every single class that meets in every building and classroom has unique and diverse needs. And yes. so if there's a particular class that has some unusual challenges, I think that's part of building operation and part of running an effective building that you're having conversations with teachers to say, oh, this seems like an unusual um, group or there's some behaviors that are unexpected. What can we do to give extra support to your class? So we do that as much as we possibly can. Um, but given the budget restrictions, we can't always just add additional staff members. So it's, it's creative and it's kind of like putting the most um, area of need the most area of need addressing that at the time but definitely there's not an, there's never enough humans to go around to support our students and our teachers so it's a little bit of a challenge but yes we have ongoing conversations constantly about where help is needed and where can we shift some of the support staff that we have to be able to assist the teachers that are most having difficulty with differentiating great thank you yep. Ms. Bresnahan anything no no, okay. I'll, I'll keep my comments. I, I think just being a general ed teacher, you are dealing, your classroom is diverse year to year. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have to put buzzwords on everything, but being a teacher, I mean, you have to meet every single child's need in your class, whether it's a general ed class or if you have support in your classroom. So I just, I applaud the teachers every single day who have to face this. And um, it's nice how we evaluate them and can offer help, um, you know, or suggestions, or and some will take it, and some will be like, no, I'm, I'm absolutely fine. So, <laughs> what, what do you mean? Some will some will take. Well, it I think and some, some will say, no, I'm absolutely suggestions. Fine. Some that teachers, are some teachers, and some will say, I've been doing this forever, so I'm good. Yeah. So that's what I'm. Jake, do you have two seconds, or do you have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> I, Wait, <laughs> let's just call out your personal life. Yeah, right, exactly. That's all right. This Perfect is on YouTube. Timing. You didn't want to no go there watching. anyway. <laughs> no one's so uh, I couldn't help but notice when you asked your first question and you were talking about sort of like the higher grades and you said, look, there are some times where, you know, you see, you know, kids, if they have trouble or whatever, they might drop a teacher, they might drop a teacher. And you rolled your eyes. You gave a very oh, knowing geez. eye. So I'm not. I'm, so I reason, didn't see so the eye roll. So now you go to the bathroom. Like the reason, so the reason why, here's why I bring this up. And this is why I thought it was important now to have this discussion. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, we all talk, we always talk about the chain of command and the chain of communication. Critically important. That doesn't mean that as a school committee member, um, I personally don't start to hear trends about particular teachers. I'm probably not saying anything you guys don't already know. You have high performers, mid performers, like low performers on staff. And Tony is intentionally not making eye contact with me because <laughs> he's in HR. But what I'm super curious about, and I think you touched upon it a little bit, Danielle, is when you see, when there are clear trends, when there are clear trends of older students and older students' families who continue to uh, give sort of feedback to whoever's willing to listen about particular teachers and they have very explicit feedback that cannot be misconstrued. I 
am really wondering, and there may not be an easy answer to it, you may not be able to answer right now, but how do you sort of thread the needle of being respectful of the chain of command? Go to your teacher, and hopefully that, that's, I know it's gonna be a hard communication, but hopefully it'll go well. How do you close that gap around trends that bubble up in the community around particular teachers who may need help to be better teachers so that it gets to leadership and so leadership can put an action plan together to help address those dark, shady areas that didn't show up in your presentation. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, yes. behavioral issues, communication issues, organizational issues on the teacher side. Uh, so how, like, you know, and I am totally biased by coming from the private sector. And in the private sector, I know it can be so much more straightforward. But I'm curious about how we work or how we can work to start to analyze eye rolls and trends from students. You start to see, hear the same thing. Not everyone can be wrong. <laughs> so you say, how does that, how do you close that gap so that um, you can start to address personnel issues with teachers and make a decision on whether it's improvable or the marriage isn't going to work out? Well, I think it always starts with coming at it with, an, with a respect being the first thing in mind. And so I think at times I see that there may be issues or concerns that parents have with teachers that we never hear about because they just avoid yeah. taking that class, that level, and it doesn't come to us. And so it has happened occasionally since I've been here that I hadn't heard a single thing about a concern that had come up, but I had heard from some parents that they were avoiding certain classes, which to me is not showing respect for the process that we have because how can anyone improve or how can we work with staff members if we don't know that there's concerns there? And so I think that all our teachers are always asking is that please go to them first. Um, and if you can't do that, then there, we can't really address issues. I can't ever go to a teacher and say, I heard from someone, they want to remain anonymous, that there's a concern. Either make that change or you're going to have to be placed on an improvement plan. That's just not how it works. And so yeah. we have to go through the schools. We have to go through the proper channels. And so. The expectation is that there's communication between parents and our teachers respond to that, even if it's a hard conversation and not feedback that they're happy about hearing. We feel as though we have lots of support available with our curriculum supervisors. If anyone is struggling, we want them to come forward before it becomes an issue to say, hey, I need some help here. This isn't going well. I'm having some challenges with um, some of my students or my this parent and I, we're not seeing eye to eye on this issue. And so we have curriculum supervisors that can sit in on parent meetings. Certainly if things can't be resolved at the classroom level or with a joint meeting with the curriculum supervisor and the teacher. We can bring the principals to be involved with that. Um, and I think that the most important part is frequent walkthroughs and frequent um, classroom visits so that we can see with our own eyes that if there's a teacher that's struggling or if um, some concerns about organization or um, consistency are not happening, that we can have conversations, targeted conversations during those observation, pre-observation and post-observation meetings. Yeah. And so I think the most important thing is to not avoid a teacher because you've heard something because I think that some people's favorite teacher are someone else's teacher that maybe it wasn't their favorite teacher of all time. And so there's so many different learning styles of our students and there's different teaching styles of our teachers. One of the most important experiences our students can have is learning from a variety of adults through their schooling years because when you go to college, you don't always get to have um, a warm, cuddly, huggy teacher that's going to be teaching you calculus in college. Sometimes you're going to have someone that may have a different style than you're used to and it may not match up and you still need to be able to get through that class. And so we always want to have students be able to um, experience a classroom for themselves and not have it be based on someone else's opinion. Because I think a lot of our teachers, um, they do have different styles and different personalities. Teachers are human beings too. Yeah. And so um, we want to also protect our teachers from ju a judgment that's not fair, but we also want to support them and address issues that come up. So that's my best politically um, correct and that was very political way correct. to answer so the that. Only, I mean, so the only thing that I would and I probably don't need to say this. I'm sure, in fact, I'm sure that I don't need to say this, but my guess is there are gonna be times where the, whatever the perceived issue is, it's just too awkward to go to a teacher with. And I would trust that you folks would be able to 
have an ear to parents if the parents and the, the students are, um, you know, sort of wise enough in their thinking to say, like, look, this isn't something I'm going to talk to the teacher about, but I trust the administrative staff. And in this case, I'm going to say something to the administration because I really don't know where else to go. But my concern is that it, my concern is that serious. And if it's one, well, then it's one. But if it's five and if it's ten, then I think, you know, your answer to Katie was right. It's not necessarily political, right, but you start to sort of see those trends and you have to, you know, you have to sort of, you know, I'm sure consider um, taking some action for, uh, you know, for improvement. Because the, you know, the point about, you know, you have to be exposed to different teachers and styles, I completely get that. But there's a limit. You know, if, if, if I'm... If I'm huge, if I'm hugely into science, and I've got the aptitude for it, and I'm I want to take a certain level, but you know I just can't function. Um, that could complicate my ability to get into the college that I want, and that has nothing to do with like being able to suffer a teacher. It's more like, look, I mean, this is a problem, and so there's a human element here. It's not just. And I know what you're yeah. getting at. All we do is the human element. Yeah. Schools. We're dealing with so, lots of humans, yeah, whether yeah, it's all yeah. of our students. Those are the easiest humans for us to um, take care of. But I yeah. think we're dealing with teacher humans and we're de dealing with parent humans. And I think it's a delicate balance of sure. there are definitely times when issues come up that someone wouldn't feel comfortable to talk directly to their teacher about. However, we have an obligation as administrators. If we have a conversation like that, we have to go back to the teachers and have a conversation with them, even if we can't, you you know, even if we can't give the source, which we usually can. There's not many circumstances I can think of where we wouldn't be able to say where it's coming from. Yeah. But that's just, um, we can never skip that process where we're having conversations about concerns and not going back to our educators to be able to do that. But I definitely oh, hear, sure. oh, I hear you that like sometimes the first step is to go to the administrator yeah. to ask for some like, how do I manage this? This is a concern. This isn't working for us. What are our next steps? I think and we can guide. Yeah, yep. for sure. Okay. And my guess is that, um, Guidance is a treasure trove of data for that because a student is first going to go to guidance and say, switch me out or never give me that teacher again. Right. Right. If it's right. for that individual student. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. if there's a pattern, then. Yeah. So right? it's, it's not an exact science, but that's, I mean, but that was the spirit of the office hour communication or the office hour question and concern. I think you were in that one with me, right? So, um, yeah, it's, so it's, it's shades of gray. But if you hear enough of it, it sounds like you have ways in which you can address it, and yeah. you have to do it that way. Yes. Anyway, so that's good. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the educator evaluation? I thought that was, like, really helpful. Cool, man. All right. Uh, so next mm -hmm. on the agenda is the uh, – Jake, do you need to excuse yourself? <laughs> Poor Jake. 2022-2023 <laughs> uh, <laughs> Title One, Two, and Four grants update. And I think that's Dr. Wilcox. Yes, thank All you. Right. Sure. So we have um, Title One, Title Two A, and Title um, Four. Sorry, as I'm going through. <laughs> title Four are entitlement grants. And so what that means is that we are awarded the grants regardless of um, if we, regardless it's a non-competitive grant. So each year all we need to do is apply and through that application process we need to show how we are going to use the funds and then we are um, either approved or we're asked questions about how to um, validate or provide more information about how we're using the funds. So from this year, our federal grant allocation for Title I is $98,369. Our Title IIA is $41,904. And our Title IV is $10,000. Um, for our Title I, Duxbury is a targeted assistance district. And so what that means is that we uh, look at our students and we look at the data from the beginning of the school year and then we target the assistance that we provide through um, the Title I funding, whether that is a tutor, which is what we use our Title I funds for, or whether it is a resource that has been purchased with Title I funds. Um, for a school-wide program, you must have 40% or greater for free and reduced lunch population, so we typically do not um, 
we are typically not a school-wide program due to that. What I um, wanted to share is a little bit about how our Title I funds are spent. So we had a Title I summer program and we had students from kindergarten through grade five come in this summer for three weeks, Monday through Thursday, and they worked with some of our teachers um, just to continue to develop some of their skills over the summer. We have math tutors, three at Chandler and three at Alden who work with our students who are targeted through looking at that data process. And then this year we are going to implement before or after school tutoring depending on the school. At Chandler we'd like to implement some before school tutoring for some of our Title I students and then at Alden some after school tutoring. And then we are also extending it into grade six looking at our preliminary data and um, extending that into grade six as well. So that's something that is new this year and we will be developing. We also use Title I funds for professional development for our leadership of Title I designated schools through the CASE conference. And we also use the funds for the Homeschool Connection. Last spring, we held a Title I summer kickoff. And so we had Brian Lease who came and presented and shared his new book. We shared some games for parents and students to participate in together and different ideas that they could do over the summer. Thank you. Title I was only, it was like 98,000, right? So for the Title I, the Title I allocation was $98,369. And what we do is you're allowed to flex your Title IV funds. And so that um, is what we do. We take the 10000 and we flex it into Title I so that we have a total of $108,369. I do a lot with that. <laughs> with like and that's more than we amount. usually get, so that's good. A lot happens with that Title I money. Yeah. Um, just a little bit about how our students are identified for Title I support. So we use assessments and we rank order students to include um, as part of the beginning of the year assessments. And so I just shared um, links and these are available to any um, parent on the websites. Um, that show information about assessments that are used. So at Chandler, there is a page under Chandler Elementary School Curriculum where you can learn a little bit more about the curriculum in addition to an assessment guide. Right now, um, so you can download the document and that gives um, information about the assessments that are used. Um, and I won't go through these completely, but I just wanted to make the committee as well as um, the community aware that this is available. There is also the same page for Alden as well. And so um, there is an Alden assessment guide as well, which is located on the website under the curriculum and assessment. So some of our services, as we discussed, may occur in class in a small group setting, um, as well as before and after school. And we want to just re remind um, everyone that Title I supports are fluid and students may move in and out of the services. So we really want to target students with different interventions with what they need, and then we want to ensure that we are providing that boost so then they're back, whether it's um, out of the small group within the classroom or they're back in the classroom. Um, and they're working at grade level. Sorry, one more question. Please. If, if you have like three kids who qualified for Title I at the start of the year and then move out, are you able to like then see if there's three other kids that now, okay. <laughs> yes, so we're, we are continually. Um, I didn't know if that was a question. <laughs> I didn't know if it was like all but or nothing. Yes. <laughs> like three new kids that take their spot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we reassess the um, students. When we say rank order, we have fall, winter, and spring benchmarks, so kids are always moving in and out. So our, our Title IIA funds are really focused on high quality professional development. And we use our Title IIA funds to fund our mentor training program. And so that is a training program that takes place with any mentor in the district before school starts. In addition to um, providing some of the stipends for our mentors, for our new teachers and staff members, 
as well as the Title IIA funds are used for administrator supervision and evaluation training. So the training that Dr. Klingeman was referring to in her presentation regarding evaluation and observation, those are funded through Title IIA. And then our Duxbury second year teacher course is also funded through Title IIA. And some of these photos are just of our new staff this year attending our new teacher orientation. And as mentioned before, our Title IV funds are flexed into t our Title I program to organize and create the most available funds for our students in Title I. I just listed a few of the frequently asked questions, but, and I'm happy to answer any other questions that you may have regarding our Title I, Title IIA um, programs. Excellent. Any questions? That sounded just like a podcast. I've got a really nice voice for this. You should start a podcast, Dr. Wilcox, about Title I. Thank you very much for that update, uh, Dr. Wilcox. Uh, okay, next on the agenda is the school safety update and the return of Dr. Klingeman. Who yes. always looks up at Do the screen confused as if it's not on the agenda, which oh, makes no, me nervous. Oh, no, I'm not confused okay. at all, all right, Mr. Good. Gambino. All right, I just don't go. have my glasses with me tonight because I'm a little discombobulated. Um, I just want to pull this slide up in front of me. What's up? Okay, so I just wanted to give a brief safety and security update. I feel like I already have done mentioned some of these things at previous meetings this year so pardon me if this is repetitive but I think it's been on everyone's minds as sure. we start the new school year um, so where we are right now we worked with the Duxbury Police Department throughout the summer to identify the most crucial necessary safety enhancements and um, as I mentioned at previous meetings our police chief is one of only a dozen in the state who attends and is participating in um, just an emergency crisis response planning which makes me feel so secure knowing that our chief here in Duxbury um, is on the forefront of this work in the Commonwealth and so he did a walkthrough at the end of last year just um, talking to some staff members that he encountered while he was um, doing his visit, looking at our entrances, looking at our um, facilities just to be able to say um, where do we have any vulnerabilities and how are we doing with our plans and is everyone familiar with the procedures. And um, he was able to provide us with some great feedback. Um, and throughout the, um, at the beginning of the summer, we had an executive session with the select board, with the Duxbury Police, with um, Rainey Reed, our town manager, and with the school committee, where we were just, we had a conversation about what are some areas that we um, could look to address on the short term, and what are some safety and security upgrades that we could look to request funding for on, from the town with, that are more long term or more expensive that might be capital projects. And so we um, worked with Christina Knowles, our facilities director, and Mike Woodford in the tech department because a lot of the um, quotes that we were looking for over the summer required either technology or facilities work to be done. And so we have, um, you'll hear in a few minutes from Lisa Freely, um, just that we have some fall town meeting articles that are coming up, including an, um, $150,000 that we're seeking from Fall Town Meeting to be able to do some security upgrades. We're ready to go with them. We have quotes, we have vendors, they're reaching back out to me asking when they can get started and I just keep telling them they have to wait till town meeting. So I'm hoping for a positive outcome at town meeting. But I do want to say that we have a select board that proactively reached out and said, can we have a meeting? We, what do you need? We want to find a way to support you, which just kind of speaks to the way the Duxbury Town Departments work together so proactively. It just makes me proud to be part of this community when things like that happen, and they do all the time. And so we have um, an executive session coming up just to be able to close the loop on some of those recommendations because some of the upgrades that we're recommending are things that we wouldn't necessarily be announcing publicly because we never want to show our hand with what our security plans are, but we always want the public and the parents to make to be aware that we're, we are always looking at it. Um, if issues come up, that's why we do drills because we want things to come up during a drill that we can adjust and fix before anything ever happened um, in real time. So as I mentioned, um, we have those updates that we're, ho we're hoping that the community will support at our fa fall town meeting, which 
I keep forgetting what the date is. It's a Monday in October. It's and the I hope 17th. 17th, I think, yeah. and I hope many of our parents are able to arrange babysitting for that <laughs> evening so that they can come out because we do have a couple of um, articles on the warrant. Um, we had mentioned at the end of the school year, some of our parents had pointed out that um, some school districts, many school districts have safety and security um, sections of the website. And so we've been working on that all summer, and we're hoping to have that launched by October 1st. Um, but that just will have information for families that we can share about what what we do, how we call weather-related emergencies, what happens if um, there's a situation at school, how is that handled. Um, we do do drills throughout the year. Um, we do many fire drills during the year as part of our practice, and we also do safety drills. Um, and I know a few parents have reached out whenever we, they hear lockdown drill, and you might have little ones that are at Chandler's school or even at Alden school. And I feel like Lockdown drills are scary no matter what age your kids are, and I think some of our middle and high school students are a little bit more used to it and understand it. So I always just want to emphasize to our families that um, Chandler School is very aware of the developmental level of students, and so the language used when we do any kind of drill at Chandler School is at the appropriate developmental level with the language they use um, for what they're practicing for and the, and the way the teachers explain the drill to the students. It's not presented in a scary manner. Um, but I would recommend that any parents that have questions prior to us doing any of those drills have a conversation with Mrs. Wiesahan or Mr. E if it's Alden School or just ask questions to say if you, if you know that you have a particularly anxious child or someone that might react in a, I have a more strong reaction to um, a doing that kind of drill, definitely have a conversation. I know when I was a building principal I had a few families that I knew I needed to talk to before we did a fire drill or a lockdown drill because their child may not tell us at school that that causes them anxiety, um, but we wanted to make sure we had a plan. So that's, that's absolutely something that we always take into consideration. We are planning to have our parent school Duxbury Police Department Safety Forum um, in November after town meeting, which we um, I'll be working with Lieutenant Chubb to plan, and we'll hopefully get a date um, for people to set aside soon. And we also have some really amazing parents in Duxbury that have some ideas for enhancing safety and security in our community that's kind of outside the realm of the school and so we're hopeful that they will be able to share some information that evening as well. Um, we've gotten, had some people that reached out to us over the summer. Um, Julie Bonatti is the, the parent that visited us at either the May or June school committee meeting and also met with us over the summer and with the police department. So we're hoping to be able to partner with um, them for some kind of parent resources and recommendations. We had safety and security training for all of our teaching staff um, and instructional assistants on the first day of school when all of our staff were, the first day of um, convocation day when our teachers and instructional assistants were all back. And on the October 7th professional development day, we have our instructional assistants here with us during that full day PD day. They come to two PD days a year, um, and that is one that they will all be present and will be doing um, presentations. Dr. Wilcox is planning for um, all of our emergency procedures that all staff members will participate in in collaboration with the Duxbury PD and our SROs. And the way the um, trainings are done, they do a global presentation for all of our staff members, but then if there's a teacher that has a classroom in kind of an odd spot, the SROs are great about going with a teacher just to visit and to be like, okay, your room is over here. Here's, here's kind of how we would tweak your emergency response planning. So we try to tailor it to each individual teacher's need or where your office is located so that when it comes time to practice a drill or if we ever needed to evacuate or go into a lockdown or a shelter in place, all of our staff members are hopefully feeling really comfortable um, because of the training they've taken part in. Um, and I don't believe we have any lockdown drills or training for students until af that would occur af until after our October 7th PD day. And so I would anticipate that building principals in their um, weekly messages would share with families when those drills are up coming up so that parents could reach out if they have questions. So I guess in a nutshell, we just want to share that safety and security are always at the forefront of our mind, and we have conversations about this every day. Um, we are in close contact with the Duxbury Police Department. We had an incident this week um, with some concerning graffiti, and we are always in contact with our police department to talk about our response and what we can do to make sure that all of our students and staff are safe. Did I forget anything? From this end. That's great. Any questions? Thank you. Discussion? No, thank you very much. Super You're important. Welcome. Nothing more important. And uh, 
we appreciate all the attention paid to it. And that executive session is, is it Friday. this, is this Friday, Friday, right? Friday. Yeah. Okay. Morning. Good. All right. Great. Um, okay. So the, um, the next item on the agenda, I think, is the last item on the agenda. Right. So these are the uh, discussion uh, and votes for the, uh, for the proposed articles for the meeting, right? Yes. Um, okay. So like the policies, we've got to, I think we're voting on this, and we want to vote on each one separately. So rather than make the motion now, why don't we start with your discussion, we'll ask questions, and then we'll do the three motions. Okay. Um, thank you. In our last committee meeting, Dr. Klingerman mentioned that we do have um, three articles that we will be putting forward on the special town meeting on October 17th. So these are um, the three items that we'll be putting forward. I'll go through each one individually. Um, the first item, and I'll read the explanation for you. The first item is the Educational Cable Access and Technology Funds. Um, and the these funds, just to give you some background, they are funds that are available to the school department and the town um, from fees collected from the cable companies, so Cape Comcast and Verizon. Um, the way that the um, accounts are set up for the funds is the we are the only way for us to access the funds are to go and have them on a warrant for town meeting, whether it's a special town meeting or the regular town meeting. And so this would be the first time, um, I believe, that we as a school department have been able to access them in this way. So um, the funds that we would be asking, requesting through this process would be more than what we would normally receive because this is uh, an accumulation of multiple years worth of funds. There is an operational component, for lack of a better word, and also um, a capital component to the funds that, that are available to us. And so the funds would be um, used, the school district is in need of lighting, cameras, microphones, wiring, and additional technology equipment for the school committee room and the performing arts center for the, perfor for the purpose of recording and live, live streaming school committee and other school meetings, communication support, and Dragon TV equipment and support. If we get this one, do we have to sit this close to the microphones anymore? <laughs> no comment. You're going to play the fifth on that? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, okay. The next item. Um, the next item is for some emergency school roof replacements that are needed at um, Alden and the PAC. Um, upon receipt of a district roof evaluation report um, in August of 2022, the district was present, presented with numerous emergency repairs needed to Alden and the PAC roofs that would allow for um, the funding through this special town meeting warrant item would allow for more time to develop a comprehensive and long-term capital plan um, for our roofs across the district. Um, in addition to that, a portion of the funds would be to conduct an aerial scan of all school roofs um, as a component of the uh, future capital need anal needs analysis. And then the last item is related to the school safety measures that we've just spoken about. Um, and so, in summary, since the most recent school violence concerns across the country, the Duxbury Police Department and the schools have been collaborative, collaboratively investigating enhanced measures to improve safety and security throughout the schools. These funds would be used towards the purchase of enhanced security for visitor, visitor management systems at school entryways at each campus building, additional cameras at Chandler Elementary Schools, and additional safety and security measures throughout the district. If the school committee would have any questions, please feel free. Any questions? Is there a dollar sign associated with each article? There are. Um, they are not presented on here. This is the language that is for the warrants. Um, I'll give you. I can give you the estimates. So on the. Um, you don't have to. I was okay. Yeah. There. There will be dollar amounts that are associated to them, okay. um, and we had been working when we presented these to. Um, the town to meet the deadline for ha ensuring that they were on the warrant. We were just working on a couple of more quotes specifically around the um, security items. I think it's important for the school committee to know <coughs> the 
ballpark, even if you yeah. don't have the exact yeah. amount, yes, for them please. to be able yep. to vote tonight, which we do know. To yes. Yeah, what, what's the, what's the mm. big number? So on the PEG funds, um, we are, which, excuse me, the cable access funds, um, we are um, drawing about $300,000 of the operational funds and $65,000 of the um, capital funds. Uh, for the school roofs, it would be $60,000. And for the school safety items, it would, it's about $150,000. And those and two and three are both from CapEx, from capital expenditures? Capital? Yes. Okay. Great. Any other questions or discussion? I'm not sure if um, the school safety is coming from the capital revolving account. I think that that is yet to be determined which fund that which fund is going to come the from? school safety but I think the school group is from the capital yes. reserve fund and the peg funds that's another word for the cable access funds that's its own fund but I don't yep. I'm not sure where the town might determine that the school where safety it, would best be where um, it comes from okay coming okay. From. all right thank you okay any other questions all right so um we'll do three here so may I have a motion to approve the proposed article for educational cable access and technology for consideration at the October 17th, 2022 special town meeting. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 4-0. May I have a motion to approve the proposed article for a school roof replacement for consideration at the October 17th, 2022 special town meeting? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion passes 4-0. May I have a motion to approve the proposed article for school safety measures <clears throat> for consideration at the October 17, 2022 special town meeting? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 4-0. Great. Excellent. So, yeah, I hope we get really good attendance at that meeting. That'd be great. All right. It is as electric as the 4th of July parade, only in Duxbury. We have our second public comment. Would anyone like to make hey, second public comment? Could you pass that comment? extra microphone down? I don't know why that's. We have a microphone and everything. <laughs> Jen, you don't even have to share one. Don't look scared. Do you want to make a comment? No, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. On it. See, you got to sell it. No. Um, uh, no, I just wanted to reiterate that um, I think that. The questions earlier on the, the SPED audit, I think were great. And I think it would love to follow up on kind of ways to tease that out from both of our perspectives on getting parent stuff together. Um, and I know that, um, so CPAC has a meeting on October 17th. We'll sort of plan, go through our plan for the year. Um, and so welcome everyone to attend there. Usually put stuff out on Facebook. We'll put through things out through the school communication mechanisms. Um, and whatnot. The last kind of thought uh, I'd add is that on the school and safety and security aspect, I'm really excited to see the the website be built out and include a lot of the discussion here was about sort of the 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 hardening security measures around the schools, which is obviously important. Um, but then there's kind of the adjacent issues around um, mental health, the things that are kind of you know it's a it's a spectrum of approaches right towards the issue. And so maybe using the website as the um, uh, consolidation point for all the different efforts that go into um, not only present, per, you know, making sure the schools themselves are are safe, but also that we're kind of cultivating a the right environment for our kids to to speak up if they see something, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and then, can I ask one question? Yeah. On the so my child's at Chandler, um, but on the kind of concerning graffiti things like that that come up, are those usually dealt with at a school by school uh, basis? Or is that something that like gets communicated out? I'm just I'm new, so I don't actually know, and I'm curious. I heard about it today, so I was like, oh. We talk about that a lot, and so we, it depend depending on the incident, we will most likely if it's um, an isolated incident at one school, the principal will send out a note just to the parents of that school, because it is we we talk about um, with Caitlin Shee and our DEI director mm -hmm. a lot. Um, we don't want to be sending out those upsetting. Yeah. emails at the district level all the time because it starts to become just ignored as part of the, like oh here's another one and we don't want there to be any more um, if there's if there's something that involves safety or security we tend to have it come from the building level and then the other building principals will share out a message from that principal if it's something that we know that the 
parents at other buildings would need to know. Um, so we do it on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, depending on what information we can share. And so it it's so the best answer I can give you, it depends, but often if it's something that is isolated to a school, it will just be that school. Okay. But okay. always check Duxbury helping Duxbury because it'll be put right, right up for everybody to see. <laughs> That's how I learn. <laughs> yeah. I haven't opened my email yet. <laughs> Cool. Thanks. That's it. I'm that's it. All right, Jen. Thank, you, Thank Jen. you very much. Any other public comment? You've been sitting there so patiently. You have not, nothing. Thank you. Thank you. First time, long time. That's great. All right. <laughs> uh, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.